Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial Azran's Belonging Series, Explore the Lived Experience, where we look at the experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, and each week we have somebody who shares their experience, shares their story about how it is that they gained their sense of belonging. And we've been blessed that we've had so many people who have been willing to share their stories. And I say this every week, uh, and every week I am proved to be right. I am not a liar, right? <laughs> I'm not a liar. I say this every week that we have a special guest, and this week we've got a real special guest. And that is Dr. Winston True. And True by name, True by nature. Brother Winston has been is an author, he's a lecturer, and I've called him a civil rights campaigner. And he was a member of the Oval Four who were wrongly convicted. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into his story. He, that's his story, which he's gonna tell us. But um, Winston, it is a real pleasure to have you as our guest. So this week, and what I'm going to ask is the first question I always ask, which is, can you tell me what it was or what it is that, as you were growing up, gave you your sense of identity? and your sense of belonging. Hi Wayne, good afternoon everyone. My name is Winston True as I've been introduced. Well, it wasn't one thing, it was, it was several things that gave my sense of belonging. Um, my, the awareness of myself as a young black man growing up in England. Um, the most important thing was that um, in, in, 19, in, in 1970, I joined a black power organization, which was dedicated to education, um, learning about your history and your culture, and also at the same time, um, getting some skills um, for you to use as you uh, as you went on in society. Um, but the journey started, didn't just begin in 1970 when I joined the Black Power organization. It The journey began when I first came to this country. I came to this country from Jamaica in 1956. At that time, Jamaica was still a British colony because obviously Jamaica became independent in 1962. Uh, I came to my my parents came to this country first. Myself, my brothers and sisters, my brother, my brother's not my uh, sister, she had been in Borneo, came to this country. Uh, strangely enough, my first day at primary school, I was sitting on the wall, looking at the only black boy in the playground, looking around. And the white people, the white people came and punched me in my eye. I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I just sat there holding my face. Um, luckily enough, um, a white people, a uh, young girl came in and took me into the school building once the bell rang. Um, that was my introduction to, to, um, to, to come into Britain. I walked into a hostile environment. So the whole idea that um, um, <laughs> Theresa May sent me a hostile environment was in 1990s the hostile environment was it was here ever since i came to this country uh, so lots of black people walked in the hostile environment and part of that hostile environment was the color bar in mm. housing employment all sorts of things um so this, my, the process of me uh finding myself was a long slow slow journey and it culminated i said in 1970 70 when i joined the black power organization but i was still growing and, and i was still trying to shape who I was um, as a young man growing up in Britain. Um, my parents left Jamaica because um, I come from St. Thomas and St. Thomas suffered in 1951, they called the 51 storm, where basically it was a hurricane, blew everything down. People's crops, animals, homes disappeared. Um, and it swept, it swept across the St. Thomas, devastated everything. Now, my father was a, a policeman in a colonial police force. He'd left the police force before 1950. I think he left the police force in, in the 1940s because he got fed up with it because at that time, um, black men, Jamaicans, couldn't rise above being a sergeant. Yes. You, the highest you could get in the, in the ranks of the police force was a sergeant. He became a sergeant. He couldn't um, move any further up. Um, plus, he 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 got irritated at the petty things he he had to do, like deliver deliver summons to people. Because what happened then? If if you had a complaint, you'd take you you go make a complaint to the police, and they'd summons 
he'd have to go and issue the summons to, to the person, give the summons to the summon who had to go to court, and then, then you'd, you'd go to court. He got fed up with it because people uh, ran away from there, frightened of him. So um, he left the police force. It wasn't only that, lots of other reasons why he left the police force. Um, the most, I suppose, after he left the police force, in terms of employment, now my father was a very intelligent man. Um, my, my sister, older sister, told me he used to have an office, a um, little office where he sat there and, and uh, he used to be writing this and writing that. And in Jamaica in those times, um, men of letters, people could read, actually um, read, read letters and wrote letters for other people mm -hmm. and also interpreted uh, official documents. So he knew he was very intelligent. He's, he's, um, so one of the things he complained to my mother about was that um, if you wanted a job, a day's work, you'd line up somewhere where um, an appropriate place. Now, he said that before you was um, the man on the horseback, the driver, set on horseback, so people queue up behind the horse. He said to my mother, that, um, the first person in the queue was looking inside the horse's backside. And he didn't think that was a very good thing. He thought it was hum a humiliation. And as as a man of one say them got there ten or twenty men, they'd walk, they'd ride, they'd the man would ride off, and um, the other the, the, the potential workers would walk in behind them, and the horse would shit, and pee, and they'd be they'd be having to dodge all the poo, or, well, <laughs> the horse shit. He, he he thought it was very very undignified, so he he got fed up. You sold some land that they had, family land. Um, took us to Kingston. We left the country from St. Thomas, went to Kingston. Um, we stayed in Kingston. Now, because he was very intelligent and he wanted to take us, take us to England, he paid for private tuition for me. Yes, he paid a man who's called a scholar who he knew in, 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 in Kingston. I remember going to see this man. I remember um, I'd walk down the road, go along the gully, go around the gully, to his house, sit in his, in his room, and I'd, he'd ask me, I'd write, read, and ask me questions. The most important thing I think he was, uh, my father wanted me to do was to be able to reason, and to understand how I thought, and to be able to explain things. So when I first came, so when I came to this country when I was six, I could read, write, spell, count, add, subtract, also I could reason, I could understand an argument, and engage in an argument with people. That was the most important thing um, he did for me before I left Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So that's just that's the early stages of, of my so, life. So, so, so from the very outset, from when before you came to this country, you were able to read, write, and reason. Yes, right, right? And, and articulate what was going on. So, when that first day at school, which you were referring to, where the boy came up and just punched you in your face. That 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 didn't have any rhyme or reason to it, as far as you was concerned. No, not at all. Because um, as a young man in Jamaica, someone if you if you I said to, I said to mother, mother, the boy hit me, and I didn't do him anything at all. Now people don't hit you if you did something to them. Mm -hmm. I did nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So when I got home, she said, you know, she kissed my rubbed my head, kissed me. On. My father came in from work. I told him what happened. He said, um. Did you tell the teacher? I said, no, I didn't, I, did, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, could, I didn't know who the boy was. So I couldn't say, that boy over there hit me. So he said to me, if he does it again, tell the teacher. But the boy mm -hmm. didn't do it again because um, I made some friends in the school. I uh, made quite a few, um, I was the only black boy in the school, so I made, made quite a few white friends, as it were. Um, and it never happened again. Um, it, ha it happened later on um, when I was moved to Camberwell. Mm -hmm. And I was playing in the street. And these white boys grabbed my throat and held me, over, held me over the wall. My father then, good thing my father, as I say, broke the corner, came around the road, and they saw him, and they ran off. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and said to me, don't you ever let anybody do that to you again. Don't you ever mm -hmm. let anybody do that to you again. Mm -hmm. So that was, as you said, um, I had no idea why it happened. I understand now, I mean, he was a, he was a racist. He didn't like mm -hmm. black people. But he'd never seen it before, so therefore, his knowledge of, of black people was what he'd seen. TV was early days in in, in the nineteen fifties. Um, would have been um, what he learned in 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 out of school books, 
mm-hmm. Bollywog books, little black sambo books, mm-hmm. those type of books, and look at natives um, in, in the West Indies or in the colonies, as they called it then. Mm-hmm. So, as I said before, Britain was a hostile environment even before I came to this country. Mm-hmm. They did not like black people at all. So, so, other than that incident, with what were the teachers like to you? Because you've already come into the country being able to read and write, do maths, reason. What were the teachers' perceptions of you? Can you remember what did they expect you to be able to achieve? What was their... How I, did... I, I remember in, in um, the junior school, um, I got on very well, actually. Uh, I don't remember, I only, I only, I only remember a few incidents in the playground with some of the white pupils. Mm-hmm. Um, I got on very well. I wasn't aware that the teachers in, in, in the infant school were hostile towards me. Mm-hmm. It's in a secondary school that, that, that mm-hmm. they, um, they became hostile towards me. Um, so I went to a... Go on. Money. Yes. So, so I was just saying, uh, in the secondary school then, so primary school was, was okay, secondary school, you encountered what, what kind of things? Did they have aspirations for you? Because clearly your father and mother had aspirations because they'd already invested in part of your education. So they saw that that was a vehicle. So what about when you got to this secondary school then? Let me let me wind back a bit. Okay. Okay. Um, in 1959, my father got killed in an accident on the underground. Um, uh, now, he was, a, he was a, a policeman in Jamaica, police sergeant in Jamaica. The only job he could get was basically working. First of all, he was working in the, uh, in the railway station, sweeping up, picking up rubbish and things like that. Then he got the job as a, uh, a guard on the on the London Underground. And the, the role of the guard as people who travel down the ground when they had um, guards on the train was that um, the doors would open, passengers would get in. Once all the passengers were in, he'd look, he'd look out, see that it was clear, and then press the, the, the button for the doors to close, and then the train would move off. On this particular occasion, the doors wouldn't close properly. And the train wouldn't move off at all because the train won't move unless the doors are, are, are closed. So he had to walk along the, the carriages, realize which door wouldn't close, clean out all the rubbish in, in, in the grooves. Once all the rubbish was out, most of it was out, he went back to his the, the back of the train, gave the signal for the train to move off. Now, what he was doing was saying to the lady on the platform, get somebody at the next station to... um fix the doors. Now, it was the train was roaring. And then later was sh- shouting, saying, go back, go, you're heading, because she saw the train was rushing towards the tunnel. He couldn't hear, and he was putting his head out to hear, try to hear, and his head smashed against the tunnel, he fell into the train. So when the train got, it's between Cheyenne Cross and Waterloo, so he's from Cheyenne Cross, when the train got to Waterloo, the doors wouldn't open, so they opened the doors, and they found him lying there, um, unconscious, bleeding. He was rushed to hospital, I was in school, in infant school that day. Um, they came, somebody came into the class and said, I have to go and see the headmaster or the headmistress. When the headmaster said, you've got to go home because um, your father's been in an accident. What got home, I saw mother crying. Your dad's in an accident. He's, I'm going to visit the hospital. And she packed a little, uh, little, little grip with all these things in it and took him and took them to the hospital. About two hours later, the door knocked opened the door and I saw they're crying. Suddenly, your father's dead. I could not believe it. I said, dead? How can he be dead? I saw him this morning when he went to work. Your father, she was crying. She was crying. All the children started crying. I didn't cry. Cut, to cut a long story short, um, we got put into um, a local authority home. Mm. Myself, my two younger brothers. I think my sister stayed with um, my mother. Um, in the, in the country, it wasn't nice at all because, um, again, I was the only black boy in the yeah. children's home, yeah, and in Sussex, the only black boy in the school, yeah. I was treated as a joke, a novelty, mm. um, but it was more like genteel racism rather than inner city punch in the face racism. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, 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 they, they called the things like little black sambo and little gollywog, and but they thought they thought they were being affectionate, but to me, I didn't like it at all. Mm-hmm. So, when my mother used to come to visit us, she she'd be crying. When she left, she'd be crying because she had to go home without us. Mm-hmm. She missed us. Well, fortunately, um, we were, got found a home 
in Deptford. And we're all, we were all reunited with her. Then I went to Peckham in the secondary school at the age 11. That's when the trouble started because um, those boys were racist and they were violent. Mm -hmm. They'd call your names, um, they'd pick on you. You had to you had to defend yourself. Now, if you if you had to fight every time someone called your name, you'd be fighting every, every day. So we had to choose which um, incidents to ignore and which to react to. We ignored most of them. Um, they come and tell you little silly jokes, things like, um, oh, Winston, you know, 50 wogs died last. I said, what do you mean, wogs? What are you talking about? They're called the wogs then. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Oh, uh, the house called for light. Meant that there were 50 black people living in a house. That were, so they're referring to the overcrowding that black people experience because they wouldn't be rented rooms mm -hmm. ordinarily because of the color bar. So two or three families had to live in... So in one house, each floor had a family on it. Yeah. Every room was rented out. There's lots of overcrowding and discomfort. So the, these are the type of um, humiliations that you, that you experience with, with, with the white boys. The teachers just saw you as a colonial. Because obviously it's 1960s. Um, the, war, the war had finished. But people, black people still considered colonial subjects. So my time in school wasn't very nice at all. Yes, I got involved in academically in all the, all the work. I, I think I became first in the third year in everything. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't. I didn't. I wasn't raised into the high into the high stream. I was kept in that uh, that one stream for the for the high um, achievers and the stream below that for the ordinary achievers. I was in the stream of the ordinary achievers even though I was a high achiever. Mm -hmm. and it was like that. It, it, it carried on like that. No matter how well you did, um, you you weren't, your abilities weren't recognised. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was 15, I was in Brixton with my friends going to a party. My friend had a quarrel with his girlfriend. She left the party with her, left her handbag there. So um, because it was a, a big people's party, Adults told us to leave the party. You know, we don't want any boys in here. We left the party. So Errol had clawed his handbag over his shoulder. Or innocent. Turn the corner. As we walked down the road, turn the corner, we saw two policemen coming. They stopped and asked us, what did you do in the handbag? So my friend explained, no, we had a quarrel and his girlfriend left the handbag. They didn't believe us. So they said, come down to the station. We saw this. Okay. Yes, officer, we Okay, we'll come along. Got into the van. The man then started boxing and hitting, punching us up. I screamed and I just said, for God's sake, what are you doing? We got to the station. We, they were told what happened. The officer visited Claudette's address and found that she had left the bag there. So they hit us for nothing. So what they charged us with was insulting behavior and disturbing police. So we were running around shouting and screaming and making lots of noise. And, and that's why I took us to the station because we were being unruly. When we got to magistrate court, I explained to him, I said, that didn't happen. Um, I explained that my mother's a widow and we'd gone out for the evening. That's not what happened. And they gave me a conditional discharge. Mm -hmm. In those days, if you went to court, it was reported to your school. So when I got back into school um, in January, Head, called into the headmaster's office. And he said to me, you, you're bringing the school into disrepute. You had a juvenile court appearance. I said, I explained what happened. He said, no, that happened, sir. It was not my fault. Uh, I explained what happened, and the police hit us. He looked at me and said, police don't hit people in this country. Don't do this. Sort of I said, they did, they hit me. And he kept going on and on about um, how bad reputation, this, that, this, that. Uh, in order to keep an eye on me, I had to go down one year. So I said, I'm not going down one year. I'd stayed on in school in the upper six, again, to in increase, to improve my educational chances. Mm -hmm. as, as my mother and my father wanted. My mother wanted, she wanted, she carried on um, my father's wishes, with the, both their wishes. So I said, I'm not going down one year. I'm not educationally subnormal. So I walked out of school. I walked out of school in 19, January 19, February 1966, at 15 years old, 
walked out of school, preserved my dignity as a young man. Because they, they, they were treating me as if I was stupid. And I was not stupid. And I left school with as a, the, about four O levels. Because I was supposed to take some exam at the end of the sixth year. I didn't finish the sixth year. I left school with um, English language, English literature, I think English language, woodwork, and math, something like that. And that was it. So at age when I, yeah, sorry, carry on. So at age fifteen, yeah. having already been kind of like um arrested, falsely arrested by the police and charges put on you, you left school. What were your prospects? What were you what were you planning on doing then? <laughs> One of the things I was good at was drawing. Mm -hmm. Um um what we myself, my brothers, we did lots of drawings. We we read comics and we basically drew the superheroes. Became very, very Spider Man, X Men, things like that. Mm -hmm. Became very, I became very, very good at drawing. Sorry. Let me tell you something. Um, so I, I went to the careers office. I said to them, What would you like to do? I said, I want to um, become an artist. He looked at me, an artist, said that you have to spend years training and there's no guarantee you'll get a job. But there are lots of vacancies on the buses. Again, so therefore, do, do join the rest of your country people, countrymen on the buses. I said, but I don't want to join. On I don't want to um, become a bus conductor or bus driver. I want to become an artist. Anyway, I left that. Um, I spent the next three or four years doing odd jobs. I would think the longest job I had was working for Woolworths as a stockroom assistant. Mm -hmm. um, worked at Worked at various jobs, so on and so forth. Um, in 1969, I met my first wife. We got married. Then my brother came around one Saturday and said, told me he joined the Black Power organization. They were talking lots of about Black history. And he told me things I'd never heard before, that um, Egyptians are Black, the Moors are Black. The the, the 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 Greeks learned science and technology from the Egyptians. Um, lots of things. And I, my, my head was just spinning. So I went to the meeting on the Sunday, and I never looked back. I heard things. I I felt so good when I heard. I was the room was full of lots of young black people. When I went, hello brother, hello sister, hello brother, hello sister. It's the first time in my life I'd been in a congregation of young people, all black. We call me brother, sister. They were dressed in black, blackberry, Afro haircut. Some of them had dashiki. Women had their hair plait in cornrow. All sorts of stuff. It was wonderful. It was a first. I I felt good. I felt at home. I could, as I, said, I felt I could belong there. I felt a sense of sense of belonging. I said yes. And that's it. My whole um, my whole outlook changed. Um, it was good. Um, I joined the organization. I, because I was so skilled, um, I, I drew, drove up, um, went up the ranks. I became a member of the Publicity and Propaganda Committee because I could write and reason. One Thursday, we were invited. We had to go and represent the organisation at the meeting. There's another black organisation called the Black Liberation Front. Organiz the organisation I belonged to was called the Fasimbas, Young Lions. We went, met the Black Liberation Front. We, we took, had some children, we, uh, bought some children books from them. We were on our way home. And lo and behold, when we got off the train at the, uh, the Overland Underground, walked along the platform up the escalator. At the top of the escalator, these men suddenly turned around and grabbed us and started pushing us. So, as young men said, you know, what the, listen, what the, you, we were swearing, what do you think you're doing? We're police. So, what do you want? Where's your ID? Never you bloody mind. You lot be nicking handbags from the social. I said, listen, you're not searching man. Just show some ID. Pushing, shoving, pushing, shoving, argument, pushing, shoving. The man, one of them even grabbed them, the hand, the um, carrot bag in my hand and threw it on the floor. Intimidating us. We weren't intimidated. There were the, the six men, seven policemen. Six men, one woman. We didn't see the policeman. Six men and the four of us. A fight broke out. We were, I was 21. 
he used to do karate, a fight broke out. Um, in the end, we got overpowered. I found a man, a man trying to strangle me. It wasn't until they'd overpowered us, had in a small room, and they said, oh, we have police. Good God, I've had it. I've had it. So they didn't identify themselves as police? Not officers. at all. Bridgewell, his method was to pounce on young black people, accuse them of something. When they resisted, he, they beat them up as they did us, ticket to the station, get, beat you up again in the station, make a make, force you to sign a statement. So there are four groups of black people, they did the same thing. They did not show, any, didn't show us any ID, they did not show the walks before, they dragged off the train. Took upstairs, beat them up. The sock of six, they told the lie on. Over for us, they didn't show an ID. And, and two, the two Zim African men, Zimbabweans, didn't show them any ID. They just grabbed them, wrestled them to the ground. And when they got to the top of the escalator, escal they said, oh, by the way, we're police. Right, right. We, we thought they were just white boys, right. aggressive white boys, late at night, out for a laugh, picking on black people. Well, they picked the wrong lot. But then they were police. So the tactics, as, as, as well known, accuse you of something. When you denied it, they then beat you up, take you to the police session, beat you again, and force you to sign a statement saying you, you did all these things, which you didn't do at all. That's their methodology. So, so it was brutality and intim intimidation that yeah. they used. Exactly. So you, you, you mentioned a name there, Richwell. Yes. Who was yeah, he? Um, Who was Richwell? Yes, <laughs> his name is quite famous now. His, his name's been in the press. Mm -hmm. um, Detective Sergeant Ridgewell, um, he framed the Waterloo Four, mm -hmm. but they were found, the judge, at the end of the case, the judge did, threw up the police case because young men complained they were, being, they, were beat, they, were, they were teenagers, around 15, 16, um, so they were beaten up by them. So the the, 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 um, the juvenile court stopped the case, threw out the police case, and made a complaint to the British Chancellor Police about brutal behaviour. Also, one of the young men went to Lambeth Council for Community Relations, made a complaint about the violence used against them, and they made a complaint to the British Chancellor Police. Next group of young men, six of them will get them get. Um, Woodrow's story was that um, six of them got in a carriage with him. Pulled, they pulled a knife on him and tried to rob him. The young men said nothing, none of that happened at all. They were never on any train with Rudra. They were they were they they were walking, leaving they were leaving the Oval Station, and I saw these men following them. So I thought they were ticket inspectors to show them the tickets. So we're not interested in that, and we just want to find out who you are. Told them there was a comp stairs. We check out who you are. They followed them upstairs. They started to beat them up. And told them told them that um, they tried to rob him on the train. So we weren't on the train with Rizzo. They beat the hell out of them, took them to court. All that all five were found guilty. One was found not guilty. Why? Because he couldn't read and write properly. He signed a statement saying he did all these things. When they test, when they found out, he said he had learned it, but he couldn't read and write properly. So how could he have written? How could he have understood what he'd written in the statement? That didn't make any difference at all. They jailed everyone. The oldest one, who, who was supposed to have the knife, was given three years. The rest were given bullshit training. Um, then there was us, Oval Four. Now, he carries on. He says, um, one Sunday, two Zimbabwean men from Zimbabwe, obviously, mm -hmm. they, were, they were a Jesuit priest. The Tottenham Court, Court Road station, trying to find a way around to, so they can take a train to Paddington and get a train to go to Oxford. They're wandering around on the platform. Suddenly, he said these men grabbed them, re you know, wrestled them. Now they thought they were going to be robbed because they heard about this mugging thing in London. So they fought back. They were beaten, taken upstairs. Then the police said, Oh, by the way, we're police. We saw you trying to pick some women's handbags. They said, What are you talking about? We weren't doing anything like that. Went to trial. 
In the middle of trial, the judge stopped the trial. He said, hang on a second. All of you men have given different, all of you police officers have given different accounts of where these men were on the platform. None of it marries up at all. He said, it's terrible. How can people go around in London having police jump on them, do not identify themselves? Mm -hmm. He stopped the trial, freed the two men. They, they, I think they awarded costs. And he made a serious complaint to the British Transport Police, British Transport Police, about Brazil's behavior. Is it, is it behavior was appalling? Two Jesuit priests, they're accusing of trying to pick pockets. He said it, it's not it's, it's not in their mindset. Mm -hmm. What did the British Transport Police do? They gave Brazil a promotion. <laughs> They took they took him off the underground, um, where it's supposed to be. Um, he told the court that um, that uh, he he had orders to patrol the underground, looking out for coloured men late at night. And we people called coloured men in those days. They called you a black bee if they wanted to insult you. But they called you a coloured man if you wanted to describe you. They took him off the underground, sent him down. They promoted him, put him in charge of guarding the royal mail, the royal mail. They sent him down to Clapham. What did he do when he got to Clapham? <clears throat> he arrested his three white men, so they'd stolen 13 mail bags from the, the, from the Clapham goods depot. Framed the, two, framed the three white men, they went to prison. He left, they went to Bricklayer's Arms, and the recent case of um, Salia Mehmet and Basil Peterkin, Mm -hmm. Framed them, planted them with, with um, put goods in a locker, and said they were they were, they were stealing parcels by directing them, relabeling them, and send them to their homes, other people's homes. The men said that we never did any such thing. The men were jailed, found guilty in jail, and two years later, no, the seven, no, seven, 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 seventy-eight Rigels found was caught driving van loads of goods. Out of the bricklayer's arms, goods of. So he was stealing the goods. What he did was to blame other people, blame those two, one Turkish Cypriot man, another uh, African Caribbean man, for stealing them and got them sent to prison. Now those two men died before their convictions could be quashed. So I attended court of appeal last Thursday, glad to be there, and they had their convictions quashed because by that time, the whole court knew that Rizal was a crook. Mm -hmm. It was a crook. What then happened, he was found caught stealing Van Van Lander's goods. He was found at the time, the, it was equivalent to one million three one million three hundred thousand pounds with today's money. That's the amount of goods he stole over over 18 month period. Wow. He basically um teamed up with local gangsters to rob the railway. He was taken to the old Bailey, he pleaded guilty. He was given seven years in prison in, in January 1980, and he died of a heart attack in 1982 in Paul Oakland Prison. Now, some people think that he was he was murdered. Gangsters, gangsters supposed to have a long arm, and they must have um, contacted other people inside the prison or, or prison officers and had him murdered. So, so, all right, so timeline which you just... Yes. 1970 was when he arrested you, 72 when he arrested 72, us. 1972. Yes. Right? And you and your the Oval Four yes. were convicted and had to spend time in, in prison because yes. of something which you were innocent of. Not completely yeah? innocent, yes. How did that make you feel, knowing that you're innocent and and this man has stitched you up, lied, and he's a policeman? Huh. It's really, I mean, the irony is, is that... Um, my father's a policeman. That's right. In this country, was fitted up by another policeman. Yeah. And then I met another policeman who found out who found a former British Transport police officer who basically found out uh, found who gave me basically assisted me. How did I feel? I felt like crap. Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I could not believe it. I, I'm asking myself. How can I be found guilty for something I didn't do? Mm -hmm. 
We were released from prison the following year. We appealed, and the British Transit Police opposed our appeal mm -hmm. against conviction. But the judge um, said, because we've been found not guilty on some on uh, the confessions they'd beaten out of us, he cut the sentence to one year. And we release. We had to go back to prison to release the following day. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the appeal on on July the thirtieth, and I was released thirty first of July. I felt like I felt like I felt like dirt. How 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 did that impact on your relationship with your wife, with your your family? What, what, how did all of that happen? What what happened there? Who, who did they basically? I we broke up my broke up my marriage because I'm, my wife, my first wife wasn't all that keen on me to become in joining Black Power. The strangely enough, right, and the evening I was going to the meeting, Thursday evening, she was complaining that I spent too much time out of the house. So I promised her, I said, look, the moment this meeting finished, I'm coming straight home. We'll spend all day Friday together. I'll go to karate Friday evening. I'll come home, spend Friday evening together at home, and spend Saturday all day together. That, that was my plan. So... Could you imagine when the policemen then stopped those men, stopped the talk that they saw us, we were, we were thieves, and then beat us up, took us to the station. All was on my mind at the time was, I promised my wife I'm going to be home. Why the heck am I in the police station for? Mm -hmm. So although my wife, my wife, he said, look, she said, if you weren't a member of that Black Power organization, you wouldn't have been arrested. Then you, 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 you would have been here. Does she blame Black Power for me being out for the police to? Although she blamed the police for arresting and telling lies in it, said, but if you weren't there, that couldn't would... have been arrested. If you... So she blamed Black Power for it. And she had a hard time because we had two young children. Mm -hmm. My income uh, uh, was no longer there. All she had was family allowance. She had to and, and she had to get um, something. She had to get some extra money because I was in prison. She had, she had to go to work and, and also pay for a childminder. Mm. Times weren't good for her at all. Mm. The organization supported her by, because um, what they did was to give her like 20 or 30 pounds a week while mm -hmm. we were inside. They collect money, you know, they look, obviously they look after members' families if, if they were wrongly, well, if they went to prison or anything like that. But I was innocent. Now, the good thing is that my mother believed me. She said to me, she told, um, when the police came and said that, um, I've been arrested for um, fighting with the police and also um, trying to pick pockets. My mother said, uh, my son wouldn't pick any pockets. You might, you might fight the police, but you wouldn't pick any pockets. He's not that type of person. She believed me thoroughly. Mm -hmm. My family believed me. Members of the organization believed me. Some of them didn't believe me. One woman I met on the road said to me, she saw the BBC program on the 31st of July called Force Concern. The detail of all of the 16 cases, the four cases, 16 young black men that visually fitted up. She opened and said to me, Did you really do it? I said, Of course I didn't do it. How can you ask me? You know I didn't do that. So some believe it, some didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I felt like rubbish. I lost mm -hmm. confidence in myself. Um, I became angry. I was angry with the world. I, angry with the, I hated the world. I hated the police. I hated myself for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. things had just got completely out of hand. So by the end of the year, um, the next year, she'd gone to America and taken ch children with her. I was left by myself. Mm -hmm. No job, no partner. Um, it, it was tough. It was tough. Mm -hmm. I was an angry young man. Mm -hmm. Angry. When I met my second wife in 1973, 74, I was still angry. Mm -hmm. Told what happened to me, and she said, "Oh goodness me!" I told, her. but I, 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 this, I lost my temper over any anything. Mm. I had nightmares. Rudolf was occupying a room in my head. He wasn't paying me the rent. That's how I put it. He turned a hand grenade into my life, blew it up, blew it up, smashed it to smithereens. So I spent the next forty-seven years trying to pull my life together again. How I did that was by doing research on Detective Sergeant Rudrow. So he became he became the focal point because exactly. you to, you, yes. you wanted to clear your name. I wanted to clear my name. When I came out, I made a I gave an interview to South East London Mercury saying 
I'm innocent, I'm going to clear my name. Mm -hmm. Then I made a complaint to the Director of Public Prosecutions, naming Rudrell and other Metropolitan Police officers to be involved in perjury and violence against me. Mm -hmm. They said to me, um, about six months later, I got a letter saying um, they could find no evidence to bring any charges against any of the officers concerned. I was it. I said, well, I'm gonna find I'm gonna find the information. I, I collect all, new, all the newspaper cuttings I did. Even I even collect news, news, newspaper cuttings when I was in prison. Collect newspaper cuttings when I came out, collect all the information I found in books and magazines, Western and World at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I then did some more research on the police. Then in 2000, with the, with the Freedom of Information Act, I wrote off to the government, to the Home Office, and to the British Transit Police to find out about Rudolph. And did I find out about him? I found out lots about him. And I wrote a book called Black for a Cause, not just because. Mm -hmm. And chapter four was dedicated to Detective Sergeant Rudolph. And his, his um, phrase was that, um, I just, they asked him when he was in prison, why why did you become a villain? He said, oh, I just went bent. So that he was just, just went so, bent. Yeah, he said, I just went bent. I said, why did you, why did you become a crook? He said, oh, I just, he just shut up, oh, I just went bent. That was his dad. <laughs> so so he, 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 he corrupted and destroyed multiple people's lives. And his excuse was, I just went bent. Yeah, he said, oh, I just went bent. And, uh, I couldn't help it. I, you know, I just went bent. So, what was the consequence of of you writing this book, the the book which you you wrote, Black for a Cause? <laughs> okay. Um, after I found that Rudolph was um, imprisoned, I approached solicitors and I said, um, "In order for us to take your case on, you, this is the case you can get legal aid for." The restrictions were legal at that time. I had to pay for solicitors to do a search. Um, Rudolph was convicted for stealing hand mail bags. I was convicted for trying to pick pockets. So the two crimes aren't the same. So there's no automatic appeal. So once I'd written the book, Stephen Simmons phoned um, LDC to, to make a complaint. Basically, because he'd been fitted up by Rigel, it's like me, he wouldn't accept it. He would not accept it at all because, again, it broke up his family because his, his, his family had to move from where they were because the shame of um, him being sent to prison for stealing, his family couldn't take it, so they had to move. His mother said to him, son, why do you think police lie? He said, mum, I don't know why they did it. But, but son, police don't go around telling lies. Mum, they tell lies in me. Remember the stock of six, his father threatened to send him to Jamaica because he, he said that far he's concerned, police don't lie. He must yeah. be doing something wrong. Yeah. So Stephen Sim was told to Google the policeman's name. He Googled the policeman's name and found that the policeman had been convicted for the same crime he'd fitted them up for and also that he died in prison. But most importantly, he came across my book. He applied to the CCRC, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, to take his case on. Um, my book, now, Stephen Simmons, his new, new evidence of his appeal was that um, Rudrell was a criminal. So what he then did was to send the papers to CCRC. Now, the CCRC, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, only take cases of people who'd lost an appeal. Stephen Simmons hadn't appealed. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't automatically, his case had to be overwhelming mm -hmm. for them to take his case on. They got in touch with me. If I had any more information, I said, no, your book has been very, very important. That information was not in the public domain before I thought it was in my book. It yeah. was not in the public domain. It wasn't all gathered together. I gave them all, news, all the newspaper cuttings I'd collected. Um, also, I gave them um, a DVD I had of from the BBC's Cause of Concern program, detailing all the investigation they conducted into DS Rudrell. Um, after after about 
three months that they, um, Stephen Simmons' case came to court of appeal. During the appeal, the Lord Chief Justice said that um, my book was one of the pieces of evidence that became available to the defense. So my book became part of the evidence used mm -hmm. in his appeal. All the information in my book became part of the evidence used in his appeal. Yeah. He won his appeal. You, you know what? I, I was wrong in my introduction. In my intro introduction, I put author, I put lecturer, yes. I put um, justice campaigner. Yes. The one thing I missed out was detective. <laughs> <laughs> I missed out detective because it was your detective work, which which kind of like got you your, your I won't reveal, but got you your freedom. Yes. Your name. So yes, because what then happened? I needed new new evidence. Mm. I'd appealed and lost. In order to bring another appeal, I need new evidence. So I had Stephen Simmons' appeal as my new evidence at Rudolph's was criminally corrupt. Mm. All the information in my book, again, mm. was the evidence. Um, there were some other cases they they they'd found out. Um, as my. What I did, what I did, what I did as well was to. In the first appeal, we'd said that um, the water, the case of Waterloo Four, the stop of six, and the Tottenham Court Road Two, showed that Woodrow was a corrupt person. That was rejected. In this time around, it was all accepted. All that Woodrow was corrupt. The course that the the the, um, the appeal came to court, we won our appeal. I was so happy. So all all the nightmares, the heaviness that that was lying on 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 my shoulders disappeared. So tell me, I'm just wary of time. We've got. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say we'll go on for another say ten minutes or so. Okay, right? that's fine. Right. So tell me, in this, in this, in you winning your appeal, right? You won your appeal. So that exonerated your name. Yes. But what was the implication of that exoneration of your name? It meant that the criminal justice system was, there was something fundamentally wrong with the criminal justice system. And the British Chancel Police had not investigated D.S. Ridgell when he went to prison. Mm -hmm. What they should have done was to look at all of his cases, review all of his cases, to see that he did this, he did the same thing to 16 young black men. 16? 16. Yeah, the, 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 the Waterloo 4, that's 4. Yeah. Stockholm 6, that's 10. Yeah. 04, that's 14. Yeah. And Tottenham Quarter 2 is 2, that's 16. Six. I, hadn't found out, I hadn't found out about Stephen Simmons is different. I would have made 19. Mm -hmm. And then Mehmet and been 21. So far, Rudrell has tried to fit up 21 people. Six were freed by the court, mm -hmm. and the rest were sent to prison. Mm. Now, the impact so it meant, that, meant that the British Trump police weren't doing their job at all. Mm -hmm. They didn't investigate Rudrell, all the Rudrell cases. Even, even when I wrote my book with all the information, they did not dig they did not dig into that they did not follow through that information at all the impact it had was um stephen simmons family had to leave the area mm -hmm. people left the country two of my friends the over the over four left the country one changed their name that's the impact it has mm -hmm. another one forgot about it at all one man said to me um you know something, Winston. Most people would have forgotten about this and put it down to you know just a bad experience, but you didn't. I said, listen, if I didn't do something, I'm not going to accept that I did. I they sent me to prison for nothing, ruined my life. I'm going to get my, I'm going to more or less not get revenge, but um, clear my name. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it 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 broke up families. To the stock of six, said that them, one of them said his father didn't believe him. Um, when Stephen Simmons got sent to prison, they confiscated his car as as pro as proceeds of crime, because 
the 16 mailbags are supposed to, the 13 mailbags are supposed to solve it could, and were never found. Yeah. Now, he said to me, he said, Winston, how could three of us r run with 13 mailbags on our shoulders? And then when they came to the car, there were no, no mailbags in there, nothing in there. He, 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 he said he just couldn't understand. He didn't understand how the judge believed it. Mm -hmm. Also, he was told that, um, by the system, he said, look, the police are lying. Says, the duty, duty solicitor, don't tell that to the judge, mm -hmm. the jury. They won't believe you. They will not believe the policeman lying. He was, he's, he pleaded not guilty. He was found guilty and sent to prison. Mm -hmm. That's the impact it has on people. People, some people have died. I think one person ended up became an alcoholic and died of, of um, alcoholism. That's what happens to people who are wrongly convicted. That's the impact it has on them. So, um, timeline nineteen seventy two. Yeah. Right. You finished compiling your book, published your book two thousand. That's already thirty years. Yeah. I put at the start that it was 47 years. So even from the time when your book was written, it took you still another 17 years to get your name cleared. Yes. Yes. 17 more years. In that time, I'm, I'm, I remember what you said earlier on was that when you came out, there was this anger that you had. Did that dissipate? as you started to get the evidence or did you how did you use that was it in a constructive way how how did you harness that anger that you had the anger is an energy okay? mm -hmm. and i had to turn the energy from this being destructive energy into constructive energy rather than curse brutal curse the world even curse myself i turned to positive energy as I said before, Rudolf threw a hand grenade into my life, completely shattered it. My my whole personality, my beingness was scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. In me doing research on Ridgewell, I managed to put my life together again, put myself together. The more I found out about him, the more confidence I got in myself. The more confidence I got in myself. I said, yes. Now I said, now he now I was his victim. I was hunted, and he was a hunter. Now I'm the hunter and he's the hunted. Complete change of roles. So when I became quite confident in myself, um, I, 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 I said, I'm very proud of what I did when I came out of prison to do research and ritual, publish the book. Now, I've made them, clearly I've made the money from the book. It costs more to publish and get the book done then, but it doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. you, you don't fight for justice to become famous or to become rich. I, I was fighting for justice to free my name. And thank goodness it helped Stephen Simmons. It helped my three friends in Oval Four. It helped the stock of six. And because Woodrow's name was now tainted, it helped the two men, Salia Mehmet and Basil Peterkin who died before they could clear their name. And this last Thursday, their name was cleared. Their name was cleared. So me researching Rudrow turned him into a villain, exposed the fact that he was a villain, a horrible person who went around telling lies. I'm saying to myself, that man told deliberate lies. Yeah. Knowing that you'd go, go to prison. And, and he knew there were lies. I mean, even now I can't understand it, but you, I can't say I don't believe it. Neither I can't understand. I do believe it. And I do accept that the man is a villain. Now, looking back, my whole adult life, from I was 22 when I got convicted until I won my appeal in 2016, 19, 47 years my whole adult life was spent with him living rent free in my head. Yeah. In my head all the time. Yeah. When I left prison, I thought I left him in prison. 
Well, mm. nobody followed me home because it's in my head. Living rent free. Have you evicted him now? I have, I've evicted him. You've evicted him now. <laughs> evicted, him. evicted him. Because he's on the street. He's below the earth. He can't bother me anymore. Even though he was dead, he was still haunting me. Yeah. But now I'm but, a free man. But you know what? I'm go I'm, we're going to have to close off. But you know okay. what? The, the, the tenacity that you showed, right? Because many would have just said, okay, I'm, I'm an innocent man. Everybody says I'm an innocent man. But you followed through because of your conviction. Yeah, the conviction which your dad gave you from, from a young age to be able to reason, right? That ability to reason for yourself. It was, it was, it was brilliant. But it wasn't just for yourself, because you could have just it, you could have all 19 of you would have had that tarnish, that scar on their names to say that they're criminals when all of you were innocent. Had you not pursued that, then that would never have happened. And all of those exonerations would not have happened. Yeah, yeah. You know? I was so, still an angry young man. Yeah. An angry old man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Your story is amazing. Every time I hear it, I learn something new from it, right? About that, that human spirit, right? Of overcoming, right? To, to fight injustice. And yes. I didn't, I, we, we haven't discussed this, but in the interim, you also got your PhD, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still, I'm still doing it now. Doing I've your got my masters, yeah. I'm not got the PhD. It's just, just around the corner. But yes, see, my, I would have got the PhD earlier on if I hadn't been fight. What I'm saying, my PhD really is basically the degree I got for staying the course of the struggle <laughs> and fighting so hard. So yeah. the universe has given me a PhD. Yeah, now I have to get a PhD in reality on the earth. Listen, all you need to do is submit those two books and say, prove me wrong. <laughs> 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 what what you've done is is amazing, right? Yes. It's it and when we talk about PhD, PhDs are about things which are are able to demonstrate um a contribution to mankind. Yes. You contributed to mankind by yes. freeing people from yes. the shackles yes. of of Ridge, Ridge, Ridge Rolls, Ridge, can't say his name now, right? Ridgewell. Ridgewell, Ridgewell. right? You yes. you freed people from his lies. Yes. So that's that's amazing, yes. absolutely amazing. Yes, thanks very much. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask my two fine uh, people who stayed on with us, right? Yes. Um, thank you for listening. I'm gonna uh, I normally I would ask if there's any questions. If you do have a question, put your hand up quickly. Otherwise, I'm, I'm I'm moving on. All right, that's fine. So my final two questions, all right? We could do two series of this, I'm telling you, because there's still so much more. But my final two questions. Looking back, what advice would you have given to your younger self, all right? That's the first one. And part two of that would be, what do you think your younger self would turn around and say, wow? The advice I give to my younger self is advice. I, I is advice. I, the advice is, do not give up. Believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Do not give up. Believe in yourself. You can triumph over overwhelming odds, which I did do. Do not give up. Persevere. Carry on. Do not give up. Now that's what I'd say to my younger self. What my younger younger self would say to me, yes brother my older brother your advice was right <laughs> wow you listen you're my superhero you are my superhero you don't know you don't wear have to wear your underpants of your of your trousers you don't have to leap buildings all you can do you basically you can you can persevere right and i'm glad i persevered because it wasn't for my ancestors my father and my mother and their fathers and mothers and, and the fight they fought and passed it on to me, I wouldn't be in a position I'm in today. So yes, so perseverance, dedication, perseverance, dedication, and knowing you are right and believing in yourself. That's, uh, that's the, the, the key. 
absolutely amazing absolutely amazing your story is incredible your the tenacity the perseverance what you've done not just for yourself even through that that adversity that hardship you didn't let go of the principles which your father laid down to you you know and as i said to you in the week it was interesting that there was that connection of the police officer which you said you know, your father was a police officer. He showed you the integrity, what a police officer should have. Yes. Yes. Ridgewell was a police officer. He showed you the exact opposite yes. Yes. of what yes. integrity actually stands yes. for. But you, with your own integrity, yes. was able to free, the, I'm going to say, free the lives of many people. Yes. And there know? are many more to come as well. Many, there are many more to come. Yeah. Many more who's going to read my book and become inspired. Yes, right. Fantastic. Thanks thank you much. so much. I'm going to just... Thank no, you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. No, it's, it's an amazing story and it needs to be heard. It needs to be told. Yes. Thank you very much. Gonna thank everyone for listening. Yeah. I'm going to just let people know what's happening next week and then anyone who wants to stay on to have a, a chat, we can chat afterwards. So for next week, we're going to have... Um, professor Omar um, Mata, and he is a professor of fluid mechanics at Imperial College, and he's going to be sharing his story with us next week. And if you have missed any of the other um, interviews that we've done, then please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com um, forward slash belonging dash IAO. I say it every week. There are some amazing individuals. Winston is part of that that this belonging family. Um, what he's done and what he is doing and what all of these people have done and what they're doing in gaining their sense of identity. There's so much we can learn from. So don't ever stop searching. Don't ever stop um, finding your place because we all do belong. So until next week, I want to just say a big thank you and have a good week. And I will see you again next week. Thanks, Wayne. Bye.